parks and natural areas, state parks in particular, were established as places that anybody, no matter what your income level was, no matter what your station in life, anybody could come and enjoy. They were for the public. And I think that is still true today. We are able to offer so much to um, visitors because people cared enough to speak up and to do the hard work it took to preserve these places. It started early on, right? I think that there was a, a land ethic that started with the Jens Jensen's and the Albert Fuller's and you know the, the list goes on and on and on. But I, I think that that is just something that has been ingrained in the culture up here to to save it, because if you don't save it, it could go away. And you know, I, I think we've most people have traveled to other parts of the country where you see if you if you don't save and preserve something, what can happen to it? It's it's gone forever. I think one of the things about Door County that's so fascinating is we we have this really robust tourism industry, but that's grounded in ecotourism and having access to get out to the outdoors and go hiking and participate in education programs. Well, sometimes you get too protective, yep. you know, and you want to close it off. And it's that old saying, well, let's just raise all the bridges or whatever, you know. Now that I'm up here, this is mine. And that's just a disservice to society. They've got to understand the importance of the peninsula, from migratory birds to, you know, special places like the ridges, Newport, um, these critical wetlands up here. Everybody has to understand what makes this place so special. Door County's conservation history can be traced back to the establishment of one of the first state parks in Wisconsin, thanks to the forward-looking efforts of local boosters. When Peninsula State Park was established in 1909, Door County's forests were decimated. While public opinions of resource extraction, pollution, and the effects of industrialization were changing on a national level, local residents and visitors to Door County started to appreciate the beauty of nature and the recreational opportunities that open and publicly preserved land offered them. From the 1920s through the 1970s, a wave of environmental reform swept the nation. The people who were increasingly drawn to live and visit Door County were also the people who became the most concerned about preserving the natural environment. By the 1980s, land conservation efforts in the county were driven mainly by the desire to preserve and maintain the endangered native landscapes of the Door Peninsula. Urban areas where ecological services are not being provided, they have to depend on wild areas for their oxygen, for their flood control, for all the things that they can't do because they're covered with pavement. Without biodiversity, we can't support all of the creatures that are providing the ecological services on which our civilization depends. There's one theory going out that's called the rivet effect. And you think of an airplane wing and it has a whole bunch of rivets. Once in a while they lose rivets, no big deal. We will come to a point when it's lost so much rivets, the plane goes down. We want to keep as many rivets in as possible. And so places like Door County, that have not been totally degraded are actually doing ecological services for other parts of the country. 
I always take it apart because I don't put it to this part. This is my height just to... This is Rytidia delphis triquetris. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> um, this is big shaggy moss and that, and you'll see it like in these big tufts. The, uh, the, these are two of them. So um, stair step moss, Hylocomium splendens, and uh, you can see one, two, three years of growth right here. So that, that, that's that stair step oh, I did pattern. I you could... Biodiversity yeah. is both the number of species that are present in an area as well as the relative abundance of those species. And it's also the interactions between those different um, plants and animals and fungi, right? These different lineages that are interacting and uh, uh, creating that, that ecosystem. Door County is uh, remarkable in the abundance and diversity of, of plants, certainly. Lots of rare plants, lots of plants that you don't find in other parts of Wisconsin. It has lobed leaves. Mm -hmm. and the uh, mosses the... almost never mm -hmm. have lobed leaves. Yeah, in the texture, the texture you can see the single layer of cells. Uh, you can see almost see right through it. Yeah. That camera is insane. <laughs> yeah. It's a, yeah, it's it's good. My task recently has been to focus on a few lineages: the the mosses and the liverworts. These 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 so-called non-vascular. Um, plants, uh, and recently paying more attention to the lichens as well. These are all organisms that are telling us something about a site. They're telling us something about the diversity, and they're um, often very, very good indicators of ecosystem health. You won't find a midrib because the whole, the whole leaf is a midrib, apparently. The whole leaf is a costa. <laughs> I'm not oh, sure how yeah. they decide that, but um, huh. yeah, there's Leucobrium glaucum. Uh, and then we've got some really fine little, stuff going on down yeah, here. Little, little, little thing. Um, leafy liverwort, sure enough. We've got some Noelia curvifolia, holy moly. Uh, There's a holy moly in it. There's a holy moly. Wow. So you don't see that very often, is that it? I do, but I love it. It's just so beautiful. So that, like, that's my focus, and, and it's, it's, I think it's wonderful that there are other scientists in the area who they'll look at, at other parts of the community, the vascular plants, the, the trees and the shrubs and the, the, the flowering um, or seed plants. Every summer, Dr. Daniel Soluk and his team of graduate students from the University of South Dakota spend weeks in Door County studying the federally endangered Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. As America's rarest dragonfly, Door County is host to the largest and most understood population. The Heinz Emerald Dragonfly is a federally endangered species, a species that occurs really in Door County in an abundance that doesn't happen anywhere else that we know of. What we know of the ecology of the species, especially of the larvae, but many aspects of adult ecology for the species, have all come from research done in Door County. The species uh, is doing really well here. It's, it's a result of the hydrology of the place, which sets up uh, lots of springs and seeps, but there's absolutely no doubt that it's also uh, largely due to the fact that many big areas here are in, have some sort of conservation status. Many aspects of its biology are uh, challenging, but really interesting as well. Um, it's a species that lives in groundwater fed, uh, fen areas, wetland areas, and, but it's not really uh, totally dependent on the spring. Rather, it lives in these habitats that will dry up. The way it does that is by using burrows of crayfish. Living with crayfish is complicated. Crayfish will eat you if you're a dragonfly larvae, but it also creates a great hole. Um, crayfish will dig down to the water table. So if you can figure out a way to survive, in that environment, you're, you're great. You've got a shelter from the cold in the winter and also from drying in the summer. I see it, that's good, that's good. So we, we know that a lot of systems have a lot of complexity, but this is a great example of, of uh, endangered species which is dependent upon uh, one of its predators to survive. So it tells us about the complexity of these systems. 
and what we need to understand before we can manage them effectively. Hines emerald female, see the stripes? Very distinct in the way the ovipositor is. So what we're going to do, the way we do this, is we simulate what she does in the field. So watching them lay eggs in the field kind of gave me this idea just how to get eggs from them. Just dip their abdomen in. It stimulates. Oh, there they are. Oh, yep. Do you see the eggs coming? Yep. I dip it like this because that's what she does when she's laying eggs in the water. What's required for this species is areas that are even wetlands. You want to protect a wetland species, maybe you have to also protect dry lands adjacent to those wetlands where, where female dragonflies go um, and feed and have the ability to uh, mm -hmm. prosper. The other thing about those dry areas is those are also the areas that collect groundwater that goes into the wetland. You can't preserve the wetland species if you don't preserve the upland area. And so that's, that's pretty important because it has meant for the Nature Conservancy up here is they have to contemplate buying maybe land that's currently in crop. That little opening in the trees there, that is the habitat that we've studied most for all these years. Streamlet, we call it Streamlet 2, that runs up through there. It's dry now. There might be some little puddles. And the females will just lay their eggs, even in the little puddles or if there's wet mud. Our Kangaroo Lake Preserve uh, is really important for the Heinz Emerald Dragonfly. So we have one of the largest breeding sites in the county for this federally endangered species on that site. And that species really requires clean groundwater. So at that preserve, um, us thinking broader than just the wetland we're looking at and really looking at the groundwater shed of that preserve is very important for that species and for that habitat that they live within. Door County is a great place where almost everybody here is dependent on groundwater, all the people who live here. And so uh, as we use groundwater, as we contaminate groundwater, um, that has effects on these systems. And what are the limits of those effects? We need to understand that is one of the big uh, issues that's looming in ecology is uh, groundwater and uh, what we've done with it um, and how it's impacting natural systems and how it's actually impacting us. We've done a terrible job of managing groundwater resources. Further down the coast, scientific research that Milwaukee Public Museum botanist Albert Fuller started in the 1930s continues almost 100 years later at the Ridges Sanctuary in Bailey's Harbor. There, a staff of biologists and volunteer citizen scientists research the habitat of over 24 native orchids found at the 1,600-acre sanctuary. Their goal is to inventory orchid populations on the preserve and better understand the specific environmental conditions and germination techniques required by each species. Might be getting in a ram's head territory again here. Uh, I think these are two ram's heads. Okay. They're drooping and they didn't, they're not opposite. Okay. They're alternate. So that would be two ram's heads. That's a good spot. Yep. What we are doing with orchids here, I think, reflects the, the need across the world for orchid conservation. And orchid. Orchids are plants that comprise probably the second largest family of, of vascular plants in the world, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 28,000 to 30,000 species. In the United States, we've got over 200 species of terrestrial and epiphytic orchids uh, up here. And of, of those 200 and some species, over half of them are on a concern list of some sort or another, whether it's special concern, threatened, or, or even endangered listing. So they're, they're a plant that, because of their, their basic biology, are delicate plants in many respects because they do reflect environmental changes relatively quickly. And because of, of this, Orchid conservation is, is a very, very important thing. And some people refer to orchids, in fact, uh, as the canary in the coal mine, as an indicator of environmental change before other plants will indicate that change is taking place. So this area we're in right now was a, a, 
an incredible find for us because the ram's head lady slipper orchid is threatened across its entire population uh, up into canada uh, united states it's threatened in virtually every component of its habitat and we were out trekking one day uh, and uh, we were out and we happened to be heading in a different direction and happened to stumble upon but a population down yonder that um, uh, we've been manipulating now with, with data recovery for a couple of years. So uh, that's the importance of orchid trekking. We had no idea this population was here and yet it's probably, at least to our current findings, the most uh, numerous, most populous, most robust grouping of ram's head lady slipper orchids that we've come across on Ridges Sanctuary property. Most of the sanctuary proper is part of a, a boreal forest and we are probably the southernmost boreal forest at certainly at this elevation uh, in, in North America. However, not terribly far from here, we do not have the boreal forest. So we're in this transition zone and it's these transition areas that tend to be fairly fairly lucrative for orchid growth along then with the ridge swale complexes that give dry wet and everything in between you can all go half an hour without seeing anything or longer and then you've hit a really diverse area and something that you know a motto that we say is Orchids like orchids. So when you find one species of orchids, you tend to find a variety of other orchids are uh, in the, you know, the same area. Uh, we should be seeing the, uh, the lesser rattlesnake flowering also now. Okay. Or at least the flower stems are going to be very prominent. These are, are difficult to find if they're not flowering. These are right in the middle of, of flowering time and when we look at the, the couple of key features, it's got this whiter flower, but the leaves themselves of these are very distinct. This entire uh, uh, grouping, this entire genus of this type of orchid has very unique uh, foliage. And this one happens to have a, a pattern that reflects, um, apparently somebody at one time thought it looked like rattlesnake skin. So it's referred to as the lesser rattlesnake plantain or plantain. Uh, this plant right here is a fairly uh, common plant, but it's still it's a very small, very pretty little flower plant. So, so that's what we'd go about, and then Sam's and then we'll counting, count. and I'm, uh, I'll get a, a GPS mark on these guys. One, two. While orchids appear to be abundant on the 1,600 acres that make up the Ridges Sanctuary, many of the species are threatened or endangered, and population decline is occurring across all orchid species on the sanctuary. Unauthorized collection of orchids in the wild, loss of habitat to development, deer predation and changes in tree canopy cover have led to a decline here and across all of Door County. Reintroduction efforts through hand pollination, seed harvesting, and laboratory germination are helping to restore the dwindling populations. Yeah, these look good, Sam. Okay. These look good. I'm gonna take two from this one. Now, oh, if you take one from each, I think we'll be good with that. So again, this is um, uh, the showy lady slippers that we're playing with up here. And uh, it's a, a very, very nice natural native population up here. It's a, a gorgeous, gorgeous plant and aptly named. And we we'll take a look and see if this guy, it plucked off fairly easily. So that's a good sign. That looks good, Sam. Yeah, good sample. I think we'll give it a, give it a whirl, sure. The second phase of our operation now that we commenced uh, a bit earlier in collecting the pollen from the donor plants will now to be to pollinate or place the pollen that we collected uh, quite a ways from here on a few of our plants in this particular population. So what Sam will do now is um, he will take one of the pollen sacks that we collected uh, earlier and will now pollinate or hopefully pollinate uh, a donor uh, donor recipient relationship here and the recipient plant will hopefully then be fertilized by the pollen and hopefully we can harvest a, a capsule of seeds from this uh, as we need the seeds for our propagation uh, methodologies. I'm pretty confident that we can apply what we're learning from the orchid restoration project into other plant areas.
I, I truly believe we're establishing a methodology here where we can maximize these, these resources uh, for our either translocation or restoration work. As things are changing, we hope that we can be a bit proactive with this research methodology. Not all conservation takes place above ground. Karst topography is literally the underlying bedrock of the Door Peninsula. And when water reacts with the Dola Stone, it forms fissures and cracks, which over time create caves. As a result, Wisconsin's second longest cave lies on the western shore of the Door Peninsula. The Horseshoe Bay Cave is also a significant bat hibernacula. Historically, the cave would host one of the largest populations of winter hibernating bats in the state. But in recent years, an invasive bacterium known as white nose syndrome has significantly reduced the number of hibernating bats in the cave. Thanks to a unique conservation agreement between the County of Door and a private landowner, researchers and conservationists from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources and Virginia Tech University are able to access the cave to study the effects of white nose syndrome and help researchers find a cure for the disease. If I'm a bat, what I'm looking for when I you know, need a place to survive the winter is a place that's dark and quiet and undisturbed, uh, but also free from predators where I can hang up high off the ceiling, uh, and a place that's cool where I can cool down my body and conserve energy, and a place that's very humid because bats' bodies are so small that they tend to desiccate uh, in very dry environments and, and dehydrate. Um, and so that cool, damp cave environment, dark and undisturbed, is perfect for bats. So this is the cloakroom, and it's really the first spot where we can stand up and crawl into the cave. It also, because it has such a high ceiling, about 30 feet high, um, you know, when you look all the way up, um, it's a nice warm air trap uh, for bats. To, to have buffer temperatures. So we were historically finding about a third of the bat population hibernating in this room. Uh, and they also stage in this room uh, at the end of winter and at very early spring in, in February and March. They begin to move from the back of the cave just a little bit closer to the entrance. In winter, it's, this area is full of big brown bats. Um, and they're you know, so close to the entrance. And so we do get freezing temperatures and there's sometimes frost in some of these pockets, but they'll go up high into these little ceiling domes uh, where it's just a little bit warmer, a little bit more buffered. Door County is a special place for bats. Uh, bats really like to roost in close proximity to water, and with so many miles of shoreline, Door County provides the perfect roost location. Uh, it's not only forested and has rocky cliffs and crevices for day roosting, but also an abundance of barns and old buildings uh, and bat houses that thankfully the public have provided as roosting structures. Here in Wisconsin, we have eight species of bats and they're the primary predators of our night flying insects. In addition to eating mosquitoes, which people are often familiar with, they're eating uh, moths and beetles and midges and flies, uh, a wide variety of native insects uh, and non-native species of insects. So uh, they're eating things like corn borer moth and corn earworm moth, potato beetle. So they're important to agriculture uh, and to the tune of 156 million to 1.5 billion dollars annually in Wisconsin alone in pesticide costs. 50% of our bat species are endangered or threatened um, and need protection, uh, need further study, and we're really still lacking a lot of information about uh, those species and what's going on with them in Wisconsin. So, for example, we're not only attempting to track this recovery uh, post white nose syndrome, but we're interested in now understanding how bats are using the landscape and the connections between those winter and summer habitats. This is Virginia Tech's uh, device called a psychrometer. And it's getting a very precise measurement of the temperature and the humidity. It's a data logger. We're really trying to understand how the microclimates uh, and different temperature zones and humidity fluctuation within caves is impacting the bat's um, ability to survive white nose syndrome. 
Drs. Kate Langwig and Joseph Hoyt at Virginia Tech University have been coming to Wisconsin now uh, for a number of years working on long-term white-nose syndrome research. And their research on white-nose syndrome is primarily focused on investigating factors that influence transmission, uh, impacts, and that community persistence. Uh, and they and we are very interested in understanding uh, the slight differences in environmental conditions within sites that are allowing bats to survive. So that psychrometer is hanging there and taking regular recordings of temperature and humidity inside the cave. Um, and we're learning things about uh, bat survival uh, related to environmental conditions. On a few of Door County's beaches occurs a rare native thistle that is integral to the survival of wild pollinators. The pitcher's thistle only occurs naturally on sand dunes near waters of the Great Lakes and in Door County at a natural area owned by the Door County Land Trust. It is here that researchers from the Chicago Botanic Garden have been studying the pitcher's thistle for over a decade. This is a plant that's federally listed as threatened. It's uh, rare everywhere it occurs, and it occurs only in the specific habitat of sand dunes around the Western Great Lakes. So it is um, a globally significant rare species. We see it uh, probably at about 100 sites altogether, uh, but at many of those sites, it's declining fairly rapidly. Uh, the threats to this thistle include loss of, of dune habitat, recreation on those dunes, the high lake levels the last few years and the associated sand movement, we've seen a population decline, but we've seen that um, at all the populations. We're just getting bombarded by a constellation of heavy winds and then big waves, and then with not a lot of protection on the shoreline, that's just eroding away. And because the dune has been just taking that constantly, it's, it's kind of a give and take because dune systems naturally do this sort of thing where they, they ebb and flow with the tide, but it's happening because the lake levels are rising, it's a lot more frequent and it's a lot more intense. So the concern is that we're going to have a lot of erosion, but not enough buildup to compensate. And then the habitat is just kind of shrinking from both sides, also with the woods coming in a little more. So it's, it's a lot of things going against the pitcher's thistle. And the question really is how much can it withstand this bombardment before there's not a population left? So we've been working here trying to understand is the population increasing, decreasing? How does that correlate with weather and climate? How does it correlate with management? Um, really trying to understand what is the best way to take care of this thistle. We care about it. One, it's a great native species and it's quite beautiful. Um, but second, it's a really important pollinator resource. And so um, as we look at all the plants and all the pollinators that, in, that occur in dune habitats, pitcher's thistle is the one that attracts the most different kinds of pollinators. And so um, it's really a keystone species on these dunes. Um, and it's really important um, to maintain pollinators, not only for pitcher's thistle, but all the other plants that occur on the dunes. 22 total. My job is to understand how it interacts with the pollinators around here because there are tons of bees, butterflies, flies, and wasps actually that will pollinate the dune thistle. And it also relies on just the constellation of plants throughout the dune system. So we're trying to understand how all those are connected. And if we're starting to lose the pitcher's thistle, which we are because of some habitat changes, what does that mean for the rest of the system? Honeybees, while they're important and they serve a very critical role of pollinating, it's not enough. And so the wild pollinators really um, supplant that and help increase the pollination that's occurring. And there are quite a few studies showing higher fruit yields with wild pollinators available. And in all those sites that we've looked at it, Circe and Pitcheri is the most important plant for the pollinator network. And without it, we could lose anywhere from five to 10 pollinator species on the dunes. Door County faces numerous threats to its globally significant native landscapes. The greatest threat, however, may be from invasive species. 
Invasive species are non-native plants and animals whose introduction causes harm to the economy, environment, or human health. They usually have origins in other parts of the world, most commonly originating from Europe and Asia. These species can be aquatic or terrestrial weeds, insect pests, nuisance animals, or disease-causing organisms. They can occur in all types of habitats and affect urban and rural areas. Invasive species are significant and immediate threats to the ecosystems and economies of the Great Lakes Basin. With no natural predators or controls in their new ecosystem, invasive species outcompete native species, degrade habitat, alter the food web, and threaten the diversity or abundance of native species. Controlling invasive species is important because what we're doing is we're creating a more resilient habitat. Invasive species is not the only threat that is happening at our preserves and across our county. When we think about climate change impacts and some of those things, ultimately what we're doing is having a diverse suite of species, having a diverse habitat is going to increase the resilience under these other pressures. So it's, it's not about getting every last autumn olive or every stand of cattail, but it's thinking about keeping all of the pieces of the puzzle there, which is, you know, if we think back to what Aldo Leopold has said about every cog and wheel in the system, um, that's what we're really thinking about at a bigger scale. It's not the elimination of every invasive species because we can't do it, but it's, it's keeping a site that has all of its pieces still intact. But all you can do is beat it back to your borders and then it's gonna to wanna to creep back in one way or another. So it's an ongoing effort. Uh, a few people have told me over the years, why are you doing this? It's futile. And I say to them, well, even if it is futile, we're not gonna stop doing it. We can't give up uh, because it has a huge potential to really, in a negative way, impact our environment. Whether it's a state park, a residential neighborhood, or a nature preserve, invasive species know no boundaries. This is why a unique partnership was formed between nonprofit environmental organizations and federal, state, and local government agencies like Door County's Soil and Water Department to address the problem. Staff and volunteers from each of the organizations coordinate efforts to identify and eradicate invasives from Door County's natural environment. This is Dame's Rocket. It looks a lot like Phlox, except the petals there are four of them rather than five. Uh, it's in the mustard family. And so we're pulling Dame's Rocket because it's invasive. And as you look here, you can actually see that it forms what we call a monoculture. And when you look at the edge, these are all native plants. And we wanna make sure we have native plants available because they tend to have the right bloom time for our migratory insects, as well as they tend to be more resistant to uh, local pathogens and other kind of diseases that we have. But there's a whole bunch of native plants that would love to occupy this space once we free it up from these invaders. Meanwhile, at the Nature Conservancy's North Bay Preserve, a team of conservationists are identifying and mapping invasives in the vast coastal marshes. You got it? This work can only be done on foot, making it time consuming and labor intensive. Once invasive species infiltrate the area, grasses, reeds, and sedges that native insects and birds rely on for food and shelter won't exist, and the delicate balance of this ecosystem could collapse. Hundreds of invasive species are on the team's watch list, and new species are constantly being added. While a lot of practical field work is required to manage invasives properly, Land managers are turning to technology to get ahead of each successive wave. So this is the new species that we're kind of concerned about here in Door County. Uh, it's European frogbit. Uh, in 2001, it was first found in Marinette and Oconto County, so across the bay from us. And uh, one of our contacts at the Wisconsin DNR reached out to us and said, hey, um, we think this is going to be a problem. You know, you guys are technically aquatic neighbors to them. Uh, you need to start keeping an eye out for this. And all of this kind of was part of a larger effort on our end where we started modeling data to try and figure out where it would be most likely these plants arrived. 
one of the things that we started realizing is uh, parts of the UP also had um, European frog bit. And so we're starting to realize any of the currents coming from the UP area as well as um, kind of the Ocanto Marinette area, we were expecting to start seeing these populations. So um, we had a team of people go out here and start doing inventory work. And lo and behold, we found um, a handful of populations of the European frog bit in this little backwater area here. When we think about Door County, it's a really big area. And yes, we have a whole bunch of partners and land managers who are working in collaboration with us, but um, it's still a huge area. And so we know habitats that these invaders like to first kind of show up in. We also know that they like disturbance. So we like to look at like road right of ways. We like to look at um, like power easements, things where there are frequent disturbances. And so um, all of that kind of helps fuel and give us more of a direction of where we can start looking. If we think about what's causing invasive species to flourish where they are, sometimes there's really local factors. So there may be an increase of nutrients at that site that allows Phragmites to go wild. Um, in some cases, it may be our fluctuating lake levels. Uh, when we had low lake levels, again, Phragmites or common reed exploded when the lake levels came up that, you know, came back into check a little more. Um, so there can be really local factors that influence it. But then at the same time, things like climate change is causing those species to move as well. So there's new species that we're seeing further north uh, or that we could see more northerly here that we haven't in the past. And that's just because the habitat is becoming more suitable for those species. That goes for our, our native plants as well. You know, species that uh, we don't have in Door County, but maybe are in Illinois or Missouri or south of us in the Midwest here, those species we could see uh, moving northward into Wisconsin and into Door County. Door County's boreal forest is here because of what we call the lake effect climate and actually the west side of Lake Michigan is colder than the east side and that's because the predominant southwesterly winds in the summer push the warm water over to the Michigan side and then on the Wisconsin side cold water upwells from deep down and it keeps the climate here colder and it turns out that boreal forest which is your spruce and fir birch and aspen versus temperate which is maple and oak the difference between those two forest types is determined by mean summer temperature. So if you have a cool mean summer temperature, you can have a boreal forest. And this particular boreal forest in Door County is an outlier far from the main range of the boreal forest, which is well to our north, like over 150 miles to our north. If the surface waters of Lake Michigan get warmer, in spite of that cold water upwelling, it could be that the we'll no longer have summers that are cool enough su to support the boreal forest and what will happen at that point is temperate tree species like sugar and red maple, beech, hemlock, northern red oak, basswood will move in to the boreal forest and those, they will, those species will gradually replace the boreal tree species and therefore that biome uh, would then be absent from Door County and that would take a lot of smaller plant species, insect species, butterflies, birds, uh, all the smaller species that depend on forests, that depend on boreal forests in particular, would also be lost. We're at the moment of realizing what cl climate change is um, and what it's going to mean to us in the present and the future. Um, so it, it's a big question and it's a very sciencey answer because um, it relates to the average global temperature changing over time. And we all know what the temperature feels like in the here and now and today and tomorrow or today and next season and next year. Um, but that's not what climate change is. Climate change is the whole earth changing, even incremental small amounts, one degree, two degree, three degree. It matters because if temperature goes up one or two degrees, it might mean that birch trees can't make it. That temperature change actually matters for a birch tree because it's more sensitive to that increase. Um, it matters in the same way that our winters 
as we've all experienced in the last couple of years, have been a little bit more mild um, and they don't last as long, the snow doesn't stay as long and it doesn't stay as cold, that will have a huge impact on the insects that are in and around all of us in our meadows as well as in our forests. Um, so that might make it so some trees can't make it because insects make it further into their bark and end up destroying that tree a little bit more. Well, I think if we go on a business as usual scenario and we continue burning fossil fuels in the rate we have been recently, within 50 years this could happen. I mean, we could see a huge intrusion of temperate trees into the boreal forest in Door County. There's already some of that with the warming that's already occurred. Right here in Newport Park, I've found some sugar maple trees in the middle of what was boreal forest in 1979 when I did my study of the flora of Newport Park here. We're already seeing more drought effects, more heat wave effects, uh, more insect infestation effects, and these are all follow-on effects of a warmer climate. So there's already a little bit of that type of change occurring with the warming we've already had. Um, but with a reduced emission scenario, if we actually followed the Paris agreements, it might not progress much further because several decades from now, the, the climate would level off and it might actually start cooling. But with the business as usual scenario, within 50 years, we'll see major changes almost everywhere in the world. Climate change also means a change in the, in the frequency with which extreme weather occurs. And with a warming climate, that means more extreme windstorms, more extreme floods, and more extreme droughts. When you have such a significant and large body of water that you know, can move a lot of land in a single storm instance, things can change quickly. And, you know, I think that's something that we've seen here in Door County quite recently with, with some of the storm events. We had a number of new ridges forming um, at the Ridges Beach. And when the water came up, it washed those ridges away, you know, and so it erased a, a lot of work that, that previous lake levels had done. And, and, and that's something that we just need to be aware of. And, you know, I think a lot of that could probably be traced back to climate change and, and what's happening with rising temperatures and increased water levels and uh, large storm events. You know, that's going to change the way that our landscape looks. And, and, and again, I think that that's the biggest threat facing Door County is that we are surrounded by um, Lake Michigan and the Bay of Green Bay. And, and those, that, that large body of water can have a huge impact on the way that our peninsula looks. We, Door County, of course, will never be able to solve this problem alone. Um, we are w one of many small subregions that all have to work together. Um, but what it's clear that we can do is take meaningful actions that are part of the, the global solution. Um, what, is, what is disconcerting is the problem is gargantuan and it seems to um, go against some normal human psychological kind of problem solving things that we do. Um, but what is fortunate is that we really do have a whole lot of solutions that together will make a difference both locally and globally. Well, you hear about young people being concerned about global warming and climate change, and I'm hoping that more of this is a concern and, you know, people work to change the way we live to help reduce the effects of it. But it has to be worldwide. It's, you know, it's not something that can be done right here and make any big difference. Um, but I think caring for the wild parts of Door County that remain and supporting the organizations that um, are continuing to do that is important. The mental health benefits that natural landscapes and open spaces provide modern society were never formally recognized when the state legislature established Peninsula State Park over 110 years ago. But over time, as Door County's natural areas grew in size and number, society began to support that notion. And today, it is widely accepted by health practitioners that immersing oneself in the natural environment 
helps promote a longer life expectancy, increased energy, reduced stress, and better mood. I invite you to cl close your eyes or look downward. And we're gonna start with three deep breaths, slowly in through your nose and slowly out through your mouth, just expanding your lungs as far as you can. Forest bathing is a type of mindfulness ecotherapy that immerses participants in nature as an antidote to contemporary society's fast-paced burnout culture. A connection with nature has been seen as a vital component of what makes us human. One thing I always notice when I walk through that stretch is the variety of trees living together, the old with the young and the different varieties and how peaceful it is that they're all getting along and <laughs> um, it's just so calming. For years there has been research that any time you spend in the outdoors in a green situation you actually have uh, actual health benefits your blood pressure drops, you breathe better, all of those things. But there are also very important mental health benefits. I think people are really recognizing the health benefits of nature. And I know there's a lot of movements out there. They've been talking for 40 years about this, that um, the trees are giving off uh, different chemicals that actually help our bodies heal. And I think people just being out in these places, feel all those healing benefits. As our cultures continue to become more urbanized, I think we need more of these places. We're, we're still a species that had a lot of time out in open places and we need it. To a generation of visitors and residents, Roy Lukes may have been the most notable conservationist and environmental educator in Door County. Before becoming the Ridges Sanctuary's first naturalist in 1966, he taught science to students throughout Door County. But it was at the Ridges Sanctuary where he met Charlotte and their mutual appreciation of the natural world found a home in Door County. He was, he was the first naturalist and manager to produce, develop a summer program, an educational program. He was a teacher in the Door County Schools. He started at um, Gibraltar School as a science teacher in 64. So this was his summer job. His writing alerted a lot of people to things and we would get numerous phone calls, you know, asking questions about this part of nature and about that part. And we ended up informing a lot more people just by them reading. You know, basically they, they were the, almost like the 911 call for nature. If you had a question, you'd just call the ridges and talk to Roy or Roy would come out and uh, say what kind of bird or flower or mushroom or whatever. It was, uh, it was an incredible resource and everybody just knew, that, well, we'll just call the ridges. And the kids just loved what he taught and that I think is important. Even on doing hikes, Roy took out many groups on hikes and if there were children he would he would actually concentrate on helping them he would get down on one knee and have them do something and um, just get them involved and interested and he said if you can't get young people to know and learn and care about the environment they're not going to care about it to preserve it when they get grown up he had such a wealth of information in that experience and he conveyed it in a way that uh, wasn't the technical side. You know, he, he could always relate to all the different audiences he ever talked to. He did it in a, in a way that people started to, it was almost like the light bulb started to go on. He, he made connections, he immersed in a, in a topic. He did it in a fun way that engaged people. And then they started to make their own connections. That was the inspiration of where education really needed to go in the county. Roy and Charlotte Lukes were Door County's original environmental educators. They saw the value of educating future generations about their native landscape and natural environments. Their legacy of education continues to this day through numerous programs sponsored by nonprofit organizations like the Door County Land Trust, Crossroads at Big Creek, and the Ridges Sanctuary. Here at the Ridges, we, you know, we have 85 years under our belt of, you know, education, preservation, and research. And my favorite thing is that we have the opportunity to educate 
kids that are just walking all the way to adults that are 110 years old. You know, we, we have such a wide array of um, educational opportunities. And I think the biggest thing for, for really little kids is just getting to touch things and experience nature in a very intimate and direct way. Uh, it's a great opportunity for kids to take a moment to step away from the classroom, step away from the screens, and immerse themselves into our natural environments. Here's an opportunity to get those kids out engaged in a way that develop that, that mindset of, um, you know, we're, we're here immersed in nature. We don't have to drive down the road to, to see nature. And you immerse them in a way, it's, it's just not a field trip. They're doing science. They're doing art. They're doing whatever outside to um, understand what's out there. Crossroads at Big Creek started as a school forest for the Sturgeon Bay School District, but over the years has evolved into a public environmental education center and research facility. A former orchard site, landscape restoration has become the focus of the educational programming. Crossroads at Big Creek, our mission, uh, the big picture umbrella mission, is to in, in, inspire environmental stewardship in learners of all ages and all backgrounds. So it's a pretty broad mission and we accomplish it by doing education, by doing research, by doing restoration, by providing outdoor experiences. We are educating children. We do have adult education programs and so forth, but we want to teach by example. And our restoration project is more than just taking care of the property we now maintain. We want to be the role model we want to have people come and say, gosh, they had degraded land, and through their efforts, they have brought it up to a sustainable ecosystem. We could do it too, and they can teach us how. People want to help the earth, I think, more than they ever have, and every generation wants to be part of that. And so Crossroads is a place that we help people connect with how they can help the earth. Door County has 12 different environmental organizations uh, that work in one capacity or another and are all working really hard to protect and preserve these really unique spaces. The thing that I've loved the most about being in Door County and being part of this community is that we get to touch so many more people. So we get to be here at, you know, the ridges, for, for example, or, or in Bailey's Harbor. And I, I'm so, so, so passionate about the conservation mindset here. I get to communicate that out to thousands and thousands of more people. It's here we have people coming from all over the world to experience our community. And so once I kind of flipped that switch in my mind of like, I'm not just in a touristy area, I'm in an area that has access to so many people to, to educate and teach, I think it's amazing. We need to make sure people understand how important and fragile this ecosystem is. I mean, it's unique to Wisconsin. It's part of an international ecosystem. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we need to educate people so that they take care. You know, I think it's incumbent on those of us who make a living from those tourists to make sure that they respect Door County the way, the way we do or the way we should. <laughs> Well, what do people come to Door County for? What is there about Door County that really establishes its high quality of life? It's the natural environment. Um, I think it's one of the big reasons that a lot of people moved here in the first place because we have you know, such wonderful outdoor op opportunities. I think we have to preserve what we have because that, that is what makes Door County special. It's, it's what Door County is. I think it's a humbling experience that there are these places in nature that are so special. And I truly believe we've got this moral obligation to continue this legacy to provide these places so people can have this, this spiritual connection with our, our planet, our Earth. The uh, geography of it, the biology of it, sort of all combine in a very visceral way here. When we think about places like this, where we're here right now in the Mink River Preserve, you know, there's uh, something like 14 miles of undeveloped shoreline here. Where else is that? You know, there isn't very many places where you, you have that anymore. 
I'm happy to have people interested in these habitats because if people don't understand them and don't understand their importance, never see it, then they have nothing to relate to. It makes it much harder to protect a place if people don't necessarily see the value of it. A lot of the reason people come here, I would argue, is because we have these amazing places to be outdoors and to just decompress. And if you lose those, you can lose the reason that people want to be here. And then that affects your tourism economy too. So it's all a balance. There's a really strong passion and a really strong loyalty to being in Door County. I think we need to do everything that we can to keep the identity of Door County and central to that would be what are we doing to preserve the, the unique habitat and this, you know, this awesome wildlife around us. Now, I would hope that other sensitive areas or tourist areas across the country look at Door County and understand that you can have both land preservation as well as a, a robust tourism industry. I think the future for the land trust work and for Door County as a whole is to figure out ways to balance having these wild spaces and protected areas with more people coming and moving up to this beautiful place. And I think we'd all like to see all these features still be here, but we really need to be proactive in planning together. The land trust, all the conservation groups, the communities, the public, that's my dream. We have some tough challenges ahead of us, but we have to remember a few key things. There's only one Door County. There's only one Earth. And it's our job to decide what we're gonna to do to protect those for future generations. How to do that? We have to find it. We all have to work for our solutions, but we have to work together to solve those problems. And we have to come together as people who care about the Earth and cut through all the nonsense, cut through all the fake facts, look at the reality, educate ourselves, educate our children, and make the kind of decisions that we can make together. If we can accomplish that, it'll be wonderful, and I hope it's possible. We have a history of conservation. We have a history of educating ourselves to make smarter decisions. We already have the research and the solutions, and they are reasonable. We just have to keep working on them. The future of Door County, there's a very fine balance of, you know, more and more people are going to love and want to come and experience this place, but there has to be a desire to, to love it gently. I think a lot of our growth here at the Ridges is directly related to the, to the growth of our community, and I think the role that we get to play in the future of Door County is instilling that passion, want, and desire to protect our natural spaces.